Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Peter. Where is Peter now? Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Enrica. And thank you all for coming. I think this is the biggest group we've ever had. So uh, that's nice. It's fitting. And so I'd like to give you a bit of an impression of the American bison, otherwise known as the buffalo, or buffalo. Um, and I've had a number of chances over the years to observe these wonderful animals in Oklahoma, in Kansas, and then twice in Yellowstone National Park. Um, and th that last time, uh, Henrik and I were there this past um, May and early June, um, which is a very nice time to observe them in the very northern Lamar Valley of Yellowstone. So most of the slides will come from there. I'll tell you in a couple other places where they're from. So the, the theme is that where does an animal end for this topic? Well, as an entryway into the bison, you could say. Because um, it's something I've been thinking about more and more, this question where an animal ends. And when you're looking at a bison, in, from one point of view, there's absolutely no question where it ends. And you really want to know where it ends and you end. <laughs> and that the two ends don't get too close. Um, because these are very big and powerful animals. And they have a presence that is unmistakable. With this big body, the the massive head, which is not only massive appearing, it really is big with lots of fur. The horns that come out of the front, the beard that almost hangs down to the ground when they're walking, the big front sh shoulders and hump, and then this tapering to what seems a somewhat small rear end, right? Um, they, so they have a very specific form and way of movement, which we'll see later. And the bison are, of course, a signature mammal of the United States and North America. And they did reach into Mexico, so you could say North American mammals that have been reduced to a very, very small population, well, to a tiny population that has grown again in the last hundred years, but um, they were mammals that, that were in a huge part of, the, of our country, of our um, continent, and I'll show you a map later on. And I want to, though, start with sort of the, the contained bison, the, the form of the animal, this creature as an embodied, very impressive being, and just give a little bit of a sense of how it's formed, so where we can say it has boundaries and it has a very particular gestalt, a particular way of existing in the world as a creature that has boundaries. You see, when it's feeding, and they're grazing animals that love grass, I'll speak more about that in a moment. This is in, as I said, uh, early June. They're losing their winter coat, that's the, um, fur coming up on, off on the top on their back and they have this amazing form just a drawing of the skeleton like no other mammal they have these very large processes And this is not from a, this is just from a, like a three-year-old bison, so it would have gotten bigger. This is from a cow, the same vertebra from a cow, mm -hmm. uh, which is also a very large animal, right? But they have the, this very large spinal processes that make this hump in the back, and there are the huge neck muscles that hold the head that is very big and heavy.
This is from about a five-year-old bull. And if you, you can afterwards lift this thing uh, and see how long you'd like to hold this <laughs> as a head. You see, we're lucky. We have our heads on top of our shoulders, and we don't need many muscles. But if you have a head like this, and then you have a lower jaw as well, the lower jaw's not here, and then you have all the flesh on it and all the fur on it, this is really heavy. And then you're not holding it up like this. You're holding it down like this most of the time, right? They hold it close to the ground. That's actually a high position when they're looking up. But usually when they're walking, it's down here. And then when they're grazing, it's at the ground level. So this is a very impressive, very broad. You can see it's actually a bit broader than it is long. And the horns continue to grow. I'll show you a picture in a moment. Um, and tend to grow more and more this inward growth. They grow out and then inward. And um, as the, the horns grow, the skull gets heavier, and the bones grow, and the neck muscles grow. So they get more and more massive, These are the older animals. So I'm going to put it down now. <laughs> well, I'll put it here. So you can... And you're welcome to come and look at it later. So I wanted to compare for a moment with these other beautiful mammals that are often around the bison. Um, that's the pronghorn or pronghorn antelope. And they're also grazing animals. They happen to be the fastest running mammal in North America. They're, it's an amazing thing to see them move. And when you look at the two, you see this difference, right? Of, the animal that has the more barrel-shaped body and the head that goes up, and the, the head being held high, large eyes, and then the horns going up. The horns are antlers. They're kind of something in between in the pronghorn. And then this is an older bull um, at the bison range in Montana. And there you see just this becoming more and more having more and more gravitas, right? It's just these animals. It's very hard to express this presence of a massive being filling space and moving. Every movement is um, set, every, and, and it, you, it, you can feel the weight of the animals. Right? So it's very, they're very impressive creatures in this way. And there are just, you can see this difference in the skeleton that an animal that holds its head up high like that does not have these processes much smaller. And of course, these tiny little, very spindly legs with which it can move, you know, 40, 50 miles an hour, right? So, um, very impressive. But this is not a prong. Where does the pronghorn end? It's where the uh, bison ends. So, then one more slide. That was the comparison of a young um, bison to the adult skull. And the horns start very small. You can also see it's longer and more sleek. And then it goes more into this broadness, filling out, and then like this. And the horns grow in this manner over time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six, seven. So where you have... And, and continually this aging, ever-growing in the head of these forceful animals. What's happening between the six and seven? What happened? Yeah. Why, why, the, why is it? Yeah, they get rubbed off. So this, the horn material gets older, and when they rub against things, which bison love to do, um, so they'll rub not only with their whole body but with their horns, um, that they get worn off and it wears down to the younger core. Yeah, so that's a t typical, it's not th that every older bison has that, but that's not untypical, let's say. Yeah. So, the bison, where do they end? Well, they end at their body, which is the one where you're, you're I mean, it's very important to realize how important it is that we have this sense that animals end somewhere, right? 
That's kind of their, their physical body ends there, more or less. And then, but their living organism does not end there. It, well, where does it end or where did it begin? To Henrika's question from, you know, before where does something end and where does it begin? Well, the beginning of this fairly young, maybe a few week old calf, well, where did it come from? I think it's a she. Where did she come from? Well, from her mother, her fairly young mother, and stands in this lineage of bison that goes back thousands and thousands of years where life brings forth life, brings forth life. So you have a stream of life where you can say, in this context, biologically, the bison doesn't end, right? And it's, it's, a, it's always a beginning. It's, you could say it's, it's, on one hand, the end of a process, but on the other hand, the potential to begin a process through reproduction. So the bison in the stream of life. And we were there at the time of year where the um, um, cows had many calves. There were some that were almost newborn and then some maybe a month or so old. And so it was full <clears throat> of groups of bison, of well, cows together with their calves. I'll go into that a little bit more later. So here, this is from the bison range in Montana. These are grazing herd animals, right? They wander through prairie-like grasslands, always in, well, not always, but usually in grasslands where they are continually feeding on grass and love grass more than they love other things. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this just because I don't want to hold a talk for two hours tonight, but it's an absolutely astounding thing that an animal can digest grass. Yeah, the cows can digest grass, that um, all the um, grazing mammals, that they can do this. But they can't do it by themselves. This is already brings you to, well, where does the bison end? Because if a bison, um, as it is born, if it were to remain inwardly as it is when it's born, later on it could not di digest grass. What does that mean? It's actually taking in through its mother, through licking other animals, through feeding on grass that some adult had fed on, so the adult had, let, had left some of its saliva on the grasses. It's taking in microbes, right? Microorganisms. And those are going into its rumen. And over time, make this what we all today know under the term as the microbiome. Well, the, the, micro or, the, the organ of, with, of microorganisms that inhabit the rumen that allow this animal to digest grass. So it forms an organ, this is interesting to think about, it forms an organ out of the environment, it takes in the environment and forms an organ with countless um, species of microorganisms that allow it to survive, because they're doing the digesting of grass and through what they digest and excrete, the, the um, bison is living. So that's already a place in life where you can see, we can't just say that the bison ends at the boundary of its skin, because it's going out and feeding and licking and taking in from others, and then out of the environment, forming an organ that allows it to do that more and more and more. So ecologically, you can't say that the bison ends at its skin, clearly. It lives from the grasses. It lives from the microorganisms. And it's at the same time, by grazing, it's changing the environment it's living in. I'll come back to that in a second, but let me just show one picture. Um, as you often see a bison herd, and here you see the many um, calves. These are mostly cows with their calves. 
That was the situation we were in, that we were always seeing groups of cows with calves and then groups of bulls, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, but here, what are they doing? They're ruminating. So they're lying down and they're chewing their cud. Right? So what they'd swallowed before comes back up and they chew it and it goes back down, like we know from, from cattle. And they spend many hours a day usually lying um, and digesting, ruminating in this beautiful landscape. Right? Sometimes they sleep, sometimes they'll stand up and walk a little bit, lie back down, sometimes they get nudged by their calves. So there's always interactions going on. But in this condition, you can be there for quite a long time and just feel like you're in a really rumin ruminative environment. Right? <laughs> Right? Where that's this, this quality of the herd, where clearly the animal doesn't end by itself there either. It's part of, a member of, an unthinkable without the herd. Right? Now, um, this is from a prairie in Oklahoma, a big uh, prairie preserve with a large herd of bison in northern Oklahoma. And you can see lots of wildflowers growing there. But the, the bison are mainly feeding on grasses. And where they feed on grasses, they open up spaces um, for other plants to grow. And they're selectively not eating lots of wildflowers. So you get a really rich environment of wildflowers, forbs as they're called, in these prairie areas, as long as these are more or less wild bison and are not being you know, held in the small, confined in the small area where they would overgraze. So the ecologists who study this have clearly shown that through the grazing of the bison, you get a greater biodiversity. So there you can say, well, the bison are, in a way, co-creating the environment they're living in. Because right? the prairie wouldn't be the way it is without them. And the, um, well, let me show one more. This is, this is from back from um, Yellowstone. There were some incredible wildflowers on this um, slope where we hiked up. And it was so diverse in certain patches. It's not uniform, it's patchwork. And uh, but many, many, many species of different kinds of wildflowers in an area that's regularly grazed by the bison. Right? They're not kept out there. This is not fenced off or something like this. This is where they graze. When we came back down, you see, there were no bison. When we came back down, there were some, and we had to you know, kind of move off to the side in order to keep a distance from the body bison. Right? Uh, um, so then when they're moving through these grasslands, especially that if we go back here to these higher ones where they're in the higher grasses, they, of course, take seeds and fruits along with them. So they're distributing, right? They're distributing. They lose their fur. And who comes and gets their fur? Mice, birds. They make nests out of that. Right? So that the, the bison is in moving through the prairie, feeding on the grasses, it's contributing to the um, diversity and changes in the environment, and at the same time, it's living from that environment. So it's a wonderful thing that you can see, of course, the bison ends at its body, but no, it doesn't, because everywhere there's a signature of bison. Right? Because the prairie in that form would not be without the bison. So you can't say that it ends ecologically. So this is another favorite activity of bison. is called wallowing and making wallows. So they love to um, roll in these depressions. And these depressions are ones they've made. They're not just there in the prairie. So they will often dig if, it's, if, it, if soil is not, if it's not bare, they'll 
take a place that is often in a little bit of a depression naturally, and then they'll start um, digging a little bit, freeing it up, and then they'll roll in it, rolling in the dust. And they create then these sometimes very big wallows. This gives you a sense of scale. Henrika is standing next to it. Um, where they'll come back again and again, and then whole parts of the landscape can be wallowed. <laughs> and those wallows in springtime will hold water, for example, and you'll, you'll get particular kinds of plants that like water early in the season that will begin growing there. Later, in a dry part, dry part of the uh, season, it will attract, uh, seeds will germinate from plants that like dry areas. Um, sometimes... Um, frogs will lay their eggs there and tadpoles will swim around in them. So the wallows are continually changing in little tiny patches the character of the, um, of the prairie. And evidently you can, people have found wallows that were where the bison used to be 125 years ago and you can still tell, them, tell that they're different through the vegetation through um, them being a depression, but also the way the vegetation is over 100 years later. So, it's, so again, they're sculpting on their environment. Right? They're sculpting on their environment. So the, the light pink here is about the historical range of the bison. And then... It as the white settlers moved east, it came reduced. The darker pink, or the, the middle, the, so the range as of 1870. And then these few spots, there, there, there. That's Yellowstone, by the way, where we were. There, there, there. Were, where there were still a few hundred bison as of 1889. This incredible collapse of a population um, that's not easy to speak about because it's such an absolute tragedy and travesty, what we did there. Um, in the way of just wanton destruction of these animals and wanton destruction of the Native Americans at the same time. Right? Together. They went hand in hand. But if we go before the tragedy, imagine, well, you can't imagine this, millions and millions and millions of bison, right? And when people still in the, like in the 1870s, I have one here from 1871, Colonel R.I. Dodge in Kansas. So, he was traveling a distance of about 35 miles, 1871, and then he writes, at least 25 miles of this distance was through one immense herd. 25 miles. So that's more than halfway up to Albany. You know, all the way you're going up, 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 all the way up to Taconic, you keep going bison, 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 right? Um, so, 25 miles, the whole country appeared one mass of buffalo, moving slowly to the northward. And it was only when actually among them that it could be ascertained that the apparently solid mass was a, an agglomeration of innumerable small herds of from 50 to 200 animals separated by surrounding herds by greater or less space, but still separated. So this is something that we experienced in small, is that they're not all together, bunched together, but you have these groupings, but you could have you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of bison in this rain, in this area with his 25 miles. And there were probably, you know, one thinks maybe in the 1800s there were still, in any case, tens of millions of bison who were then in these prairie areas doing everything I was just talking about, where the prairie, they were helping to maintain the prairie. But there were other helps in maintaining this prairie. And there are two main helpers. 
in addition to the bison. And one is fire that the prairies burned. When the prairies burn, they burn down the woody vegetation that might be coming up, and grasses are much regenerate much more quickly from burning than woody vegetation does. So it holds back the, the, the forest from coming. But where did all these big fires come from? Well, people at first thought lightning, and then they start doing studies, studies, said, no, the main source of the fires were the Native Americans. They lit the fires, sometimes purposely and sometimes not purposely, right? So that it could be both, but they played a major role in changing the landscape through fire. And when they knew when they burned a fire in a particular area, that then the next year, if they did this in the fall, the next year you'd have really nice lush growth coming up from the prairie. And who would appear? The bison. Right? And who did the native peoples live from? The bison. Right? So they were in part, really orchestrating this interaction of prairie, their own peoples, and the bison um, as this larger community where, again, you can say, well, the bison is part of that, it's part of the grasslands, and part of the life of the Native Americans, which I want to come back to in a moment. So that's more the ecological side. I'm going to call that kind of the extended ecological bison, right? We have the, the physical bodied bison, and we have the extended ecological bison that in a way knows no end, but has very specific contributions to make. And I should mention one other one I, before I move on. Let me just mention one, which is the part of animals in our own lives that we don't like to think about so much, which is what we excrete, right? The excretion. So the manure, um, which is urine and dung, very important for fertilizing the prairie, right? Just as cattle do fertilized pastures. So they were fertilizing the um, prairie, and there was often um, the people out in the West who then kept their journals, like Dodge, they would write, in an area where they knew that buffalo had where buffalo had passed through the previous year, right, like a stream, you know, again in these groupings, but like in a stream, not just really wide area, but moving from one area to another. In that area, the next year, the grasses would grow especially well. They'd been the whole time fertilized with, with the um, with the dung and with the urine of the animals. So they were creating these streams of more fertile grass through their excretions. Right? And there's more to that, but I'm going to just leave that out at the moment. So also what the animal leaves behind that it doesn't need in its body anymore becomes part of that extended world that it's helping to create. Now, there's another world that the bison is also in, it's, I just want to give a few examples of, which is the bison in relation to bison and other animals. I'm going to leave out the other animals more this time. I'm just going to focus on the bison, that they perceive each other. Of course, they also perceive us. And that's different from, from grazing and spreading seeds with your fur and doing things like that. This is an, the animal as an ensouled creature, as a creature with attentiveness and specific um, ways of responding and interacting. So we, as I said before, we saw lots of these groupings of the calves with their mothers. And almost never was there a bull amongst these at this time of year. The bulls were somewhere else. And the calves would usually stay quite close to their mother. Not always. Sometimes the calves would group together and then um, follow the mother as they started moving. One animal starts moving, and you tend to have then the whole herd getting up and move. So it's a little bit like this flowing creature, super creature called the herd, moving through the environment. And 
a number of days we were in this area at the beginning of our trip, and we were observing them there every day. And then we come back, and they were gone. Okay. So overnight or wherever, they, they disappeared, and they were somewhere else. So they're continually moving through this landscape, aware of each other in that activity. So here you have, you know, the cows um, ruminating, the calves exploring or sleeping. One is in the back um, still grazing. So you have all these activities, usually very slow. You'll get a more of an impression of that a little bit later. And then you have this remarkable fact. You go for a hike. There's no bison around. And then in the distance, you see a bison. Do you see it? All by himself. It's never all by herself. It's always a himself. Um, that, and it's usually an older bull that will do this. They will wander off. And they'll be by themselves. But where do they end? Right? You kind of think, what are they? They're, they're going away. They're going away from the herd. Right? There's clearly, there's, there's a, what, do you, what would you call that? An anti-direction, right? They're going away from something. And then they're in this expansive world, doing their feeding and moving around. And then occasionally they will come together with other bulls and they form bull groups at this time of year. And then the younger bulls love to do this sparring. Um, at this time of year, they're not very serious. We've, I've never been during the rutting season, during the mating season. It's evidently a whole different story then, right? It's very powerful and um, not so playful as these younger bulls where you, you have the feeling they're just kind of using their energy, but what are they using? These lowered heads, again, it's this gesture, the heads glow to the ground and floors like this. And during that, they're making all sorts of wonderful grunting sounds, um, kind of growls and very, you know, I can't do anything like that. I don't have that kind of a body to resonate with. Um, but they're very impressive. They also make all sorts of wonderful movements with their tails. We were both certain at the end, if you really were observed for a long time, and you could tell almost everything from the tail, right? How they were feeling. So this end of the animal that is so expressive um, of its state of being. And it was usually when they were, when somebody was being a little bit uh, mindful Oh, yeah, mindful, Scott, not the right way. Language is difficult here. Coming down, to, this was a case where an older bull came down and the others were kind of, you know, where they stepped back a little bit and then it raised its tail and made some grunting noises. And, and there was this incredible tension between these fellows um, that then um, dissolved fairly quickly and then they moved on again. So here we have, you get a sense, this is this Lamar Valley, the northern edge of Yellowstone National Park, almost in Montana, but still in Wyoming. And there you have the, this, this bison herd spread out, and it gives you maybe an inkling of what it was like. Maybe an inkling, because this is the biggest free-roaming herd in the United States of a few thousand animals. Um, they can roam freely, whereby if they wander too far up into um, Montana out of the park, they can be hunted, too. So it's, there's a lot of tension in this area uh, between the farmers and the animal friends, the, the wild animal <coughs> friends, about that fact. But they're not, they're, they're not hindered in that way, which is a wonderful thing. There are very few herds like that in the United States. So... This is where I wanted to end with the slides. And what I'd like to do, and this gives you a little bit of a chance to give it, if you've never seen bison in the wild, to get a tiny feeling for, for just observing these animals, which we did for hours on end. But it's not always, you know, there's not a lot of exciting things always happening. And I've mentioned this before, people who study animals have to be very patient. 
because it, 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 cause it just, things don't happen. Although these herd animals show you more than many others. So Henrika took a number, made a number of videos when we were there. And I just want to show you one of them before then. So this is seven minutes without sound. Just live into it, the slowness, but exciting. There's some exciting things that you can see. Um, if you don't fall asleep. I have sympathy for you, though. Uh, so, OK, I have to get out of this program and start another one. This is at the Lamar River high water season runoff from the mountains. Those are bulls. They're all bulls. They weigh 1,500 pounds, maybe, right? So, just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Watch now. Uh
Those people were closer than they should have been. Dirt, salt. That's all we need. So that impression you can get from that, which of course is, you know, not the not the real thing, but you can see this this slowness and the kind of the flowing movements between the animals and how they you know the five of them were moving towards the water to go in. You know, the one makes it and goes off by himself, the other one doesn't make it, starts coming back, the other one's <laughs> The, the couple were standing there. They did not go over. Um, we saw actually little, little calves getting across that river. Um, and then running back and forth, and then the mother on the other side running back and forth, and then finally the mother made it over. And so you have all these interactions between these animals that, and I kind of think, I, what I think one can speak of, you have kind of the physical body, and then you have the ecological body of the animal in the landscape, and then you have this kind of soulscape, right? You have the soulscape of the animals, which then extends beyond, of course, the herd. It, ex you know, they perceive us. They, they will perceive wolves coming down, and they'll interact somehow a little bit, but hardly you feel like with the pronghorns that can be next to them, but you don't know what they're noticing. So there's this very it's full of riddles, the soulscape of the animals, but you can get into it a little bit when you spend a lot of time with them and see how they're interacting and their gestures and the way they're, you know, the way they hold themselves, what they give from themselves in the way of expression, in noises, and in movements, and in other things. So that's the soulscape. And I wanted to mention uh, one other expansion of the bison, I think, that one can speak of. And that is in relation to the Native Americans. Because, as I've already said, and most of you know, the Native Americans, the Plains tribes, they lived 
from the bison largely. Of course, they hunted other animals, but the bison were critical for many tribes. And so on the one hand, you could say living from them, meaning hunting them and eating their meat. But if you imagine um, a settlement, yeah, I mean, a, you know, just for maybe a week or two or a month, who knows, with the teepees and the bison who've just come back from a hunt, carrying the animals, um, and then you, everything that goes on with those parts of that animal that get, become integrated into the lives of the of the Plains tribes. So just, I'm not going to go through it all, but just you, what you can picture is there's in a teepee. The teepee is made of many, many skins of bison. They're sitting on bison, right? They're sitting on the fur of bison. They are clothed in moccasins and perhaps um, a robe, if it's colder, of bison. They're drinking out of the horn of a bison. They're cutting and, um, and, and um, working with the skin of the newly slaughtered bison, with the bone of a bison. Everything is bison, right? So their whole world physically then, and for their livelihood, is that the, the bison dies and becomes part of the human culture. That's in another extension of the bison. Right? It's, find, it's found its way into human culture and becomes an absolutely integral part of that culture. But it doesn't end there. It's not like, you know, I would think maybe many of us would be where it would be then a utilitarian use. I've got to have something you know, that needs, I, I gotta have a spoon, so let me figure out how I can make a spoon out of a bison horn. Um, it was much more than that for them because the bison had a wholly other significance. The bison was a spirit being that spoke to them, right? So the bison was a physical being that they lived from. All its parts went into their lives but the bison was a teacher and gave orientation to their lives. I'd like to read you a couple things. Or maybe just, yeah, I'll read you two. This is from the Lakota Sioux. Um, you should cut hide, rawhide, for the, um, you, should, oh, you should cut from rawhide the form of tatanka. That's the buffalo. He represents the people and the universe and should always be treated with respect. For he was not, for was he not here before the two-legged peoples? Is he not generous in that he gives us our homes and our food? The buffalo is wise in many things and thus we should learn from him and should always be as a relative to him. Right? So this is what one knows with the Native uh, Americans with many animals um, and with the plants in another way. And the bison had a specific, um, you could say, qualities of a being within their culture. And one example, I thought this one really, I thought was very vivid. A young um, boy from the Iowa tribe was out um, on a hunt with his uh, father and probably uncles, but he was too young to hunt himself. And, um, and he was crying because he wanted to hunt. And then um, Lone Walker was his name. In the distance, Lone Walker saw them shoot a buffalo bull, a small one, and leave it lying there while they passed on. Just as he was passing the carcass, sobbing and crying, the bull spoke to him. Oh, so it's you, Lone Walker. I'm glad you came, for I've, reco I've recovered and I'm just about to get up again. Now I'm going to tell you what to do from this time on. You must skin me. I got up again, right? He didn't mean that. Right? His spirit is up again. You must skin me 
over the forehead, take my horns and strip of fur over my backbone to my tail, and you must use me in doctoring. Also take a piece of flesh from my leg, dry it and pulverize it. Take some of my back fat to grease yourself and the wounds of your patients. Next, remove my dew claws and make them into a rattle. You have been trying to dream something, so today I'll show you what we buffaloes will give you, and you may heretofore, hereafter do to your own people as we do to ourselves. This doctoring is the buffalo's way. Then the buffalo taught him the roots and herbs they used to heal the sick. They were especially potent for broken bones and wounds. He showed the boy how to use splints in binding them up, and he taught him potent buffalo songs. Right. So this is one of hundreds and hundreds of such communications between the bison and these people. Right. And that's something that you know, I don't have access to. Right? That's something that I can't say. I, I can't say that I experienced that. But I'm, I spent a lot of time in this past year just reading all of these different stories and, and um, rituals and um, activities that the various tribes in the central um, region of the country um, had related to the bison. And you just see these people were spiritually in touch with manifold spirit beings that they also called animals. Right? And so this is what I say, I think, you could say is the spiritual, um, the spirit scape of the bison, right? The bison, where the bison extends way beyond the bodily, the ecological and the, the souled bison, where the bison is a is a being, a big being, that human beings may, by work and by through rituals and through um, all the things the Native Americans did in order to come into a state where they could receive knowledge, but sometimes they just received it, like Lone Walker did in that moment. And so this expansive being, right, and that makes this decimation of this the people these, these these human beings and the bison and so many other animals all the more tragic that you can feel this incredible contraction on the planet mm -hmm. and what's happened to the midwest of the united states mm -hmm. and it's getting worse and worse in the sense of the loss of culture right um and through monocultures and agriculture, and I could go into this for a couple hours, and I will not. Um, but this area that was so alive, so alive, and then disappeared and was built up with another kind of life of rural culture and agriculture, and is now um, becoming ever more monotone and devoid of beings, right? Devoid of beings. So. This, the Native Americans, of course, have felt this very strongly, their contraction and their contraction with the bison. And there have been various movements amongst them also to support you know, um, the growth of the bison together with them again. And there's an, it was an interesting conversation that a historian had with um, some Native Americans where they were saying, well, we should, they were starting an intertribal um, group that would promote the, um, the regrowth of the bison, right? And an older woman was listening to the conversation and, and said, well, maybe you better ask the bison. Do they want to come again? Right? It's so typical. The wise woman who still is in touch with that bison somehow, right? Somehow, and says, maybe you better ask. You don't just tell them they're going to do it. Maybe you should ask for mission or ask. So they actually did a ceremony. Um, and the result was that the bison said, we want to come back. But we don't want to come back as cows. 
We want to be wild. Right? We want to be wild. Um, at the present day, there are maybe 400,000 bison that are not wild, that are used for bi um, buffalo meat, and there may be 20,000 wild bison. But there's an ever grow you know, there are many, many circles of people in the Midwestern states and into the West um, where this larger areas where the bison can move, right? Where the bison can be bison like they are in Yellowstone. And so for me, it's like, can we recognize this being in its qualities again from the bottom up, so to speak, to get a sense of this very wonderful, specific way of being we call bison that the Native Americans had an intuitive um, relation to that we can work from the bottom up towards that and then see there is every reason for us human beings to um, create conditions that if these creatures want to come again, they can come again, right? So that their beings can expand into the world where we've caused an incredible correct con um, contraction even though as bodies they're still moving around, and in some places, in a wonderful way, in many respects, that's not yet the case, right? So this, for me, you know, this kind of study just says, whoa, we're really, um, we, can, we can really begin to see the beingness of a creature, its expansiveness, and think, I'm just talking about the bison, think of all the other animals and these intersecting beings of expansiveness. Um, and we really, for the sake of the earth, and I actually think for our own sake, need to give them a chance to expand again. So that's where the bison doesn't end, but this talk does. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you.